Good afternoon, guys. Let's go ahead and do an audio check real quick. See how my see how my microphone is doing. Oh, hello, Jahara. Christine, Pamela. See some moderators out there. That's good. That's always a good thing. Thank you, Volley. Wendy. Excellent. Excellent. Sounds good. I'm good and clear. That's good because we got a lot of stuff to go through. And because you will hear things in this video you've never heard before. Promise you that. But that means we need to we need to get started. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tarry just for a little bit because I'm waiting for a few more people to get online. I'm pretty sure a lot of people will go back and re-listen to it because of the subject matter, but that's okay. As many people as possible start off in the beginning. Let's see, I would love to worry about keeping time. I saw that. Mm. You got to be real careful with that, Bash Jan Denberg. A following for that. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of YouTubers that are on board with that. J J eight sixty would mean eighteen sixty, but I'm I'm 
I already showed in my video that even even some modern coins in Ireland still use that tradition. On one side of the coin, it says J1988. On the other side of the coin, it, uh, excuse me, on one side, it says J988. On the other side of the coin, it says the year 1988. It's a very old tradition. J is also a relatively new letter. You can't let numismatics be be the reason. Uh, it can't it can't be the only evidence for a missing one thousand years. You've got to come to the table with a lot more than that. Real popular theory, but I'm not on board. Please go watch my video on that. I have a video called uh, uh, "Tartaria: The Missing One Thousand Years." And of course, I mean, any I would just. If you have access to it, just go read Flamenco. I'm not on board with Flamenco, but develop your own opinion. I absolutely disagree with the man. Yeah, I don't believe he made his case. Like I say all the time, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You got to lay your. If you're going to have some some type of extraordinary claim that goes against hundreds of thousands of books that have been printed in all different languages at all different time periods. Uh, you need to come to the table with a lot more than a J being on, on a coin. Yeah. Yeah. F Fomenko's logic, his reasoning, uh, the, the things he cites, his his connection to European history being actually events that occurred in the Old Testament Bible. No, I'm not buying any of that. That's right. 1902, Inter International Harvester. That's right. Oh, 504 people. That's good. That, that's a good start. Yeah, but this isn't this isn't about flamenco. We can do. I can probably do a video about him, not about him, about but about his theory in the future. But it's just not much much to do a video about. It's very hard to prove a negative. So, I really want to see your dogs. Yeah, I need I need a got a fifth one now. Peed on me the other day. I'm kind of I'm still irate about that. Let's see. Arnold Schwarzenegger made a, a Phoenix reference. I don't know. I'm not real up on movies, guys. Y'all you know, know that. I just I haven't had time nor nor opportunity. I will say this: somebody mentioned the series Lucifer, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I wrapped it. Oh my God! Watched the first season of that, and I got I got hooked. Now on my downtime, when I can't do any more reading or writing. Yeah, I'm stuck to, I'm stuck to my TV watching Lose for now. How that happened? Really good show though. Really good show. I was, I mean, I was impressed, but, but then again, it's it, you know, it's all entertainment. All right. I slowed the chat down, guys. It's not as fast as it would normally be, but it still looks like it's going pretty fast. So. All right. International Electrical Worker Union founded in 1892. Why? Well, there's a whole bunch of things founded at the, in that time period. Hell, I'll be reading from my Bible. I got it right here. I'll show it to you in a little while when we get to the relevant passage. But my Bible was published in 1893. I have it right here. I don't have a reprint. I have the original. It's pretty old. Heavy, oh my God. Were trees heavier in 1890s than they are today? My God, that book is heavy. Uh, quick announcement. In the description box are three links. They're at the very top. We now have a worldwide chat forum where everybody who is interested in the archaics data can ask questions, can talk to each other, because there's a lot of people that follow my channel that have read everything watched videos multiple times ordered my books have sent me photos and email attachments showing me how they have marked up my books cross-referenced them with other books uh there are people deep in this research ordering chronicon from gum road and uh printing them up in in big binders and they're going through the videos and looking chronicon and i uh, like like i said i mean I really appreciate the emails telling me, man, how much you appreciate the material. But but I, I have been telling you guys from the beginning that my videos may be informative. It may be new material to you, but they're not comparable to the actual sources. They're, my videos cannot possibly convey all the information that is in Chronicon. It's impossible. 
So people, I, I get a lot of people that, uh, I don't know, it's just, I, I understand that you're thankful, but you don't have to send me 50 emails telling me, I mean, every time you make a new discovery and some, some something fires off and connects, I get it. I really do. I really do get it. I'm not trying to discourage that. But some of the emails are excessive. One or two emails thanking me is good. You don't need to send a whole bunch of them every time you learn something. So uh, having said that, the link is below. Uh, I really appreciate the guy for putting that together. Archaics Errant's chat. It's uh, uh, The link is below. It's also an Archaics Errant's basically website. And the video transcriptionist. I have all your emails in a file that want to do don't want to do uh, uh, transcripts. Listen, the website has now been modified for volunteers to click on the button, and you can you can communicate to us now through the website that you want to do transcripts, or you have transcripts ready to to put in the appropriate places, and your name will go down as the one who transcribed that certain video. By working together like this, within a week or two, we should have all 327, 328 videos uh, transcripts for all of those. It's a, and, uh, it's a lot of reading material. A lot of people can't follow me. I do talk fast. I'm trying to cram a lot of information into the videos. Additionally, you have to understand that my delivery has changed only because my, my, I have matured in, in learning this, this, uh, process and learning these presentations. I started doing my videos out of a wooden shack and I was using a tablet. So you have to understand a lot, my first hundred or so videos are very, are very poor quality. And a lot of times what you see on the screen is just random images related to the archaics research that don't have a lot to do with what I'm talking about with the narration at the time. Others are, 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 are epic presentations where there's over a hundred slides uh, that is about what I'm talking about. But then I put some music in there thinking I knew what I was doing. I, I'm not a videographer, all right? So some of those videos were tainted. And I'm getting a lot of people wanting me to at least redo the Archaics Prophecy, which is the foundational video for my entire channel. I'll probably do that soon. There's a lot of people asking for that. And I really agree now that I've listened to it again. I used to think it was good, but now I'm listening to it and it's lacking a lot, especially the music needs to be removed. So I, I get that. I really do. And uh, those links are in the description box. You want to check those out? I encourage you. There's people in Florida. There's people in New Zealand. There's people in Australia that are all trying to put these archaics groups, and they want to know how many locals are there. Can they form a chapter and have a meetup, uh, a study group or something? And, hey, you know what? I'm all for it, but that's how you do it. You, get, you just click onto that link. It's a Archaics Errant's Chat. And uh, that's how you get started. And I really appreciate that guy for putting that together. Also, we have Odyssey and BitChute and Telegram. We have videos going up on all these platforms. Uh, I'm soon to I'm soon to continue my upload. I have like 50 uploads on Reddit, but I'm about to continue those too. Not all of them are videos, some of them are articles, but uh I'll continue that too. I'm I'm slowly easing into archaics being being uh a life a lifelong project now it's no longer something i do part-time it's no longer something i'm absolutely full-time in it but i'm having to learn a lot uh i'm having to learn a lot it's a it's a learning curve i can't just fully immerse into this i'm, I'm just releasing videos when i can but there's a lot of tech and administrative things that i have to i gotta dot my eyes and cross my t's so having said all that this video is going to blow your mind you're going to resonate with this material and you're going to reverse research it. I promise you, you're going to, it's going to send you into new avenues of research on the old Testament. And many of you who have watched my dark scriptures playlist that have gotten frustrated and you're ready to throw away your Bibles. You shouldn't do that. I've told you from the very beginning, the Bible is a book of good and evil. It's up to you to find it. There's, there's, there's awesome, very intriguing mysteries and spiritual material to be found in the Bible, but you've got to get through the disinformation. Now, we're going to go, we're going to, we're going to discuss. So, yeah, before I, I run my mouth for a long period of time, let's, let's, uh, questions and answers are going to be after this presentation. This, this live presentation is going to be a while. Yeah, I'm looking at three hours. We're going to do a and a after I'm done. Uh, but uh, not during, because we need we need to get this out. There are some people that don't are not interested in the Q and A at the end. They just want to hear the you know the meat and potatoes, and I'm cool with that. We're we're going to take care of that. 
but uh real quick audio check let me look at the bottom let me go look at the bottom how am i looking on the audio okay okay look some of these notes make sure it's all there uh, i don't know why your screen's freezing mine's not you guys saying i'm breaking up I got other people saying I got excellent audio, good audio. Some say audio skips. Others say loud and clear, all good. Okay, well, these are evidently things are good on my end, and some of y'all, some of y'all have it bad on your end. Sorry about that. I can't do anything about that. But if some people say the audio, the audio and visual is good, then that means it's good on my end. Yeah, internet has been glitching lately. There's no doubt. Some people are saying refresh your page and your audio will be, will be good. All right, let's get started. 753 people on board and 427 likes. Can we mash that like button for, for Jason real quick before I get started, just so we can see a, a substantial increase? I know it'll go up through the presentation. But my friends, the world, we're talking about the world after the Great Flood the Great Flood, you guys know, was caused by the Phoenix Phenomenon. But the Near East was quickly overrun by the appearance of an advanced mariner race. I've told you guys about this race before. Who came into the newly formed Mediterranean Sea from the far west. Yes, this is what you're not reading in the history books, but you do read it in the specialist literature of the 1800s. Those men were on point. And I've cited those in my past videos. The people of the Near East said that these sea kings came from Tartarus. Remember that. This is a word. Tartarus is a word that originally meant the far west. It also meant a world without a sun. Yes. Charles Hapgood, 70 years ago, published a fascinating book. I know many of you remember this book. You can say it, you can say it from how many times I've mentioned it. Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. I have it in my library. It's on my shelf right behind me. Listen, this book shows definitive proof, absolute definitive proof, that a mariner race had mapped the coasts of the entire world, even the interiors of whole continents and it was all done at least six or seven hundred years before Columbus sailed to America or Cuba. In other presentations, I have shown that, you know, before and after the Great Flood, a, a very tall, bearded race of mariners arrived to the Near East and the Mediterranean from ancient America. I have supported this with archaeological findings and traditions that have been published in the last 150 years, showing that a thriving civilization in the Americas during the Old Bronze Age was wiped out in a cataclysm, completely obliterated, buried deep underground. Even here in Texas, we have the proof of that. Whole ships entombed inside mountains. Oh, yeah. Those of you who don't know, I have the videos and cite the sources. Many of you guys have watched these videos, so you know what I'm talking about. Now, about 340 years after the Great Flood, these fleets from Tartarus, which was, you know, it, this is where we get Tartary from. This is where we get the ships of Tarshish in the Bible. They began landing in the Aegean along the Mediterranean coast, and uh, from the south they landed at a place called Aegean Geber. These people brought their families and culture, traditions, technology. They brought everything with them. They brought a syllabus of teachings that quickly spread through the Near East and became the source material for fascinating narratives we now know in the Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern cuneiform tablets. These people brought this into the Mediterranean, Aegean, and Near Eastern world. These stories didn't develop there. This widespread syllabus of a massive destruction they referred to as the Great Great Deluge was the day that the sky fell. It was the fall of the matriarchy, and it was the rise of patriarchal priesthoods. The old world was flooded. It was completely destroyed, and this was by the agency or the wickedness of seven kings. Now, it was really a dynasty of eight kings, but the eighth king was never allowed to rule. The flood occurred. 
These kings had ruled a pentopolis of cities that was founded by the Anuna. The Anuna appeared in the Near East, and they arrived in fleets landing in the Tigris Euphrates by way of a place called Dilmun. This was 1,200 years before the Great Flood. The fleet had sailed from the south. It was universally believed that the world had been made from the blood of a slain god. How many cultures have this tradition? We still have many memories many memories of this exact same scenario. The Anima Elish, the Nordic traditions are, are, are two that I can name off the top of my head. A story, it was a story they didn't, they didn't bring. It wasn't native to the region. Uh, but there was a story in ancient times that was native to the Near East. It belonged to the Near East. It was not imported like all these other old stories. This was about the rise of a mighty hunter, and his name in the historical record for a small period of time was Merodach. All knew the story of the rise of Amar Udaak. That's who he was in the Sumerian records. Later in Akkad, he was called Merodach. How he started as a sincere and holy individual. He defeated the giants of whom he was kin because he was of Titan parentage. Remember, I've told you guys many times, the difference between Titans and giants were those who were born under the vapor canopy were Titanic. After the collapse of the vapor canopy, the first generation born to the Titans were giants. But the giants themselves could not have giants. They were not under vapor canopy conditions anymore. So within one generation in the world, in the 22nd century BC, we had three major groups of humans, titans, giants, and ordinary size humans. This guy, Merodach, he was of titan and giant parentage, meaning he was a giant, but he was, uh, excuse me, he was a giant, but his mother, a giantess, had had become impregnated after the collapse of the vapor canopy by a titan. So he was more he was more giant than the other giants, but he wasn't a titan. This is why in Near Eastern records, the same individual claims to be two parts God and one part man. Yes, you've read it. You've read all about him. There's a whole epic called the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's the same individual. So earlier he was called Bilgamesh. So anyway, he defeated the giants. He was of Titan parentage. I already told you all that. Uh, the son of a priestess. Now, here's where it gets interesting because he was found in a basket floating on the Tigris Euphrates, one of those ri ancient rivers in Babylon, and found by an Anaitu priestess who took him in and raised him. Sounds like sounds like a very familiar story, doesn't it? So. He grew to be the king of Akkad, and he was known as Sharakan or Sargon the First. He, he, he basically instigated the building of a gigantic structure, and the labor crews during the building were struck by a blast from the sky. The construction project was, was done. Many people were killed. Akkad collapsed. Akkad collapsed, and the Elamites of the east made war against him. His new throne name was now Amraphel, which is Old Semitic, and it means he made us fall. They blamed their own king for being conquered by the Elamites. So as soon as he lost his strength, King Ketolaramor of Elam invaded Babylonia, all of Canaan, and took the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam. This was during the famous Ethiopic War in Africa for the throne of Egypt. The fall of the West to Elam was in the year 1898 BC. It was in this year that a stranger called Manashtu on ancient monuments landed his ships on the shores of ancient Egypt. He invaded and he has been remembered as means ever since. His fleet had sailed from the south. Professor Waddell has, ex I know you guys, I know you guys know, though my, my long-term listeners in Arcade, you guys know, uh, one of my personal heroes outside of Thor Heyerdahl and Harold T. Wilkins is Professor Waddell. So he expertly, expertly showed us, and I have a whole video about it, the identity of means as Manashtu. Now, 
If you want to be familiar with this history, just, just listen to my video, The First Dynasty of Egypt was Sumerian. That's the name of the video. It's all about the findings of Professor Waddell, packed, packed full of data. Now, yeah, that, that video is not for the average YouTuber. That's for somebody who's hungering for that type of information. But you know, 14 years later, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in the year 1885 BC, they rebelled against Elam because they had no garrisons. There was no enforcement uh, of the taxation. There were, the, it seems like Elam had gotten weak and people didn't fear Emperor Quito Laramore anymore. So he does nothing about it. Years go by. Merodach of Babylon, he gets, he gets brave again. By this time, <coughs> he is now called Marduk. Remember, in Sumerian, he was Amar Udaak. In Akkad, he was Merodach. The, the Akkadian Empire crumbled, basically turned into Assyria, uh, Babylon, and, and, and uh, some, other, some other little satellite countries, Urartu. Well, it, it collapsed and crumbled. Akkad was gone. And at the rise of Babylon, Marduk, his name is now Marduk. He's sitting on the throne of Babel. So, uh, and in Assyria, his name, his, his throne name was Ninus. But uh, he, uh, he survived these three different dynasties. But that's not where his greatest history began. And we'll get to that in a minute. So, he sees this as an opportunity, and he raises the greatest army the Near East has ever seen up until that time, and the West invades the East. He takes it to King Kito Laramore. This epic battle is recorded in the pages of the Mahabharata. It is on the reliefs of the Parthenon, on the Acropolis in ancient Athens. It is the Titanomachy. It is the War of the Giants and Titans. Now, this is the famous Battle of Corixeta. And in the Battle of Corixeta was a battle of heroes, of gods, and of giants. Elam, representing Mohenjo Daro, Larak, the kingdoms of ancient Harappa, ancient Pakistan, and India, their armies slaughtered Nimrod's armies. This is Marduk, Amar Udak, Merodak. It's all the same. The Jews called him Nimrod. The East slaughtered the West. Almost no one returned from that expedition except the king of Babylon and a few of his retainers. It was a great victory. Now, this is the background. In, this is basically the background story to Genesis chapter 14. So the Elamites, they waited seven years after this slaughter, and then they invaded the West again. It's the year 1872, this time defeating the giants of Syria, of Bashan, of Canaan, of Argot. They, they, they humbled the Rephaims. They fought the Anakims and they fought the Zuzums and the Zamzumums, the Serum and the Horum. These races are all in the Old Testament. They are described as descendants of the Nephilim. Now, this is the very first war mentioned in the Bible, and it, it is after the after the flood. So it's all in Genesis chapter 14. But a century ago, scholars were shocked to find the entire story preserved in the Kudor Lagomar tablets. Yes, we don't have just old Bibles. We don't have just old Bibles saying all this. No, this has now been confirmed in cuneiform tablets that have been excavated in the Near East. The story of Genesis 14 is history. So, and we'll get to this big old Bible here in a little while. I thought y'all find that interesting about the Kudur Laramore tablets. And I've been talking for a long time. Let's do another audio check real quick. Make sure y'all aren't just talking because you can't hear me. Audio check. Illmatic, okay. IRS Media, how you doing? Okay. Now, guys, it was this conquest that the book of Genesis refers to when the Elamites took Lot. Remember the famous story in the book of Genesis where Lot and his family are captured by the Elamites? Yeah. He's the nephew of Abraham. This Abraham of the Bible was the son of of an Amorite. He was the son of an Amuru. We'll get to this in a moment. This is where it gets really interesting. 
As a matter of fact, let's just look at the because the biblical text is found in Ezekiel 16 3. So let me get this big book out because I know I marked it. I know I marked it. Let's go find Ezekiel 16 3. Now, really old guys. I'm going to read Ezekiel 16.3 out of this 1893 Bible. Chapter 16, verse 3. Thus saith the Lord God to Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother was a Hittite. Okay. There's nothing, there's nothing left to interpretation here. But there's been a whole lot published about that one verse to make you believe that it's a metaphor and that it means something else. It's not. And that's what this video is about. We're going to reveal who the Israelites were. Now, so anyway, we're going to get to that back in a minute because we're going to let basically scripture interpret scripture. I don't need to tell you what it means. We're going to let the book itself do that. All right. So, and it's a, see, this fact does clarify old mystery, which has perplexed Bible students. The passage reads that Abraham gathered his servants and his allies. So, the uh, Lot was kidnapped, but all of a sudden, Abraham and his family and servants take on not just an army, but a confederation of armies led by an emperor, Kudularimor, who had not been defeated. Every single war and invasion Kudularimor was in, he won. Even when he was attacked by a multinational consortium that invaded his homeland of Elam, he beat the hell out of Nimrod. So, how is a shepherd with some servants and no sons at the time defeat this, con this confederation of armies, it doesn't make sense. But you're told to take it on faith that it happened. I'm going to tell you now some a whole different version of what, of what the scripture is actually conveying. I'm going to read it to you. All right. Now. So, wait a minute. It's the book of Genesis, chapter 14. I think it's 14, 14, 14, 14, 14. Nope, it's 14, 13. Okay. The book of Gen Genesis, chapter 14, verse verse 13 and 14. Here it is. Thank you, Ferraro. Uh, listen, this is, this is how it goes. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshel and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Okay. The passage, the passage, if no one was to draw attention to it, sounds very innocuous. It really does, but it's not. It's packed with revelations that le lead us to other discoveries all through the Old Testament that the scribes of the Old Testament had scrubbed and tried to conceal but didn't do it. So, Note that the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for trained men of Abram's house is anik, A-N-I-K-H, it's anik. It is the root in anikim. The anikims were giants in the Old Testament, or they were revered as giants to the people of lesser stature throughout the Near, the Near East. They were also known for their long beards and collars. They wore beard, they wore uh, collars on their beards that denoted status. So, in the Old Testament, 
All throughout the Old Testament, the term Amorite and the term Anakim are used interchangeably many times. They are both described as tall as cedars, but it's in the book of Jasher that the Amorites are the giants, just as the Anakim. In the book of Jasher, we receive way more details about the pedigree of the Anakim being Muru. They are the Amorites. So a lot of these things were 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 uh, different different epithets and different pronouns were attached for different geographical regions or because they were from different houses of the same family pedigree. I'll show you this in a minute. The, uh, the Anakim, they were the rulers of the royal houses of ancient Argos and Mycenae called Anax, A-N-A-X. Robert Graves talks a lot about these people in his, uh, the ancestors of the ancient Greek people. Now, later Greeks revered the title, they revered the title and employed the root word in many names that were considered prestigious, like Anaxodrides or uh, the famous Anaximander. Yes, uh, it's a, it's a, it's straight out the Old Testament into ancient Greek, ancient Greek times, all the way into classical Greek era. The root. That's how prestigious this name was. So, so what we have here is Abram wasn't simply allied to the Amorites. That's an oversimplification. And the Anakims, he was one of them. He was a Westerner. Abram was a Muru. This is what the Bible says. I read you the verse. Your father was an Amorite. The father of the, of the, of the Israelites in the Old Testament, of the Jews grafted themselves into that family. The pedigree goes to Abraham. So here we have a reference. I'll get to the Hittite part in a minute. So this means that Abram was able to rescue Lot from the Elamite army because he attacked with an army himself of a Muru, many considered to be of gigantic stature. Now remember, it wasn't just Abram and his 318 trained servants, which were 318 military men, 318 uh, 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 Anakim, Anakims. And you have to understand, Anakim was commander. Anak, Anax was a leader. This means he had 318 captains, and they all had their men as well, Amuru, Westerners. Not only that, but they had the combined forces of Mamre, of Eshel, and Aner. They were also confederate with Abram. That's what it said. Real small prepositional phrase inserted in there, but it has great value. It tells us that Abram wasn't a simple shepherd that just had some people helping him and he went and took on a confederation of armies that had invaded their land. No, he was mighty. And uh and they took it to they took it to, to Keto Laramore. This Amuru victory over Keto Keto, it's hard to say it's Kuder Lagamar in the Near Eastern text. In the Bible, it's Kuder Laramore. Same person now. The Elamite Federation is the reason why Nimrod received his famous boost in history, his mysterious return to power in Babylon. Yeah, the Amorites filled Babylonia, and in, in the historical record, this is the beginning of the reign of the famous Hammurabi. Hammurabi has been linked by scholars to the ancient title Hamraphel which is found in the book of Jasher for Nimrod. Hammurabi was the king, he was the fifth king of the Amorite dynasty of Babylon. Every bit of it makes sense. The Westerners had filled the Near East. Now, this gave, this gave Babylon a great power boost because they didn't come as conquerors. They just basically came in and took over. They filled. It's like a migration where all these tradesmen, the engineers, scientists, priests, all these scribes, and, and they're backed by, by tradesmen and, mili and military orders. They don't come in and take everything over. And there's no violence whatsoever. They just filled the Near East with people who had who had vacated a foreign country and arrived by ships at multiple ports. This is the story of the, of the people that the Bible calls the ancient Israelites. Let's go further. Now, uh, it was when Amraphel became known in history as Merodach, or Marduk of Babylon, a new people of great energy, wealth, and ideas began filtering in through the West. It wasn't at this point when Abram took 
Kido Laramore's forces and rescued Lot using all his his Amuru soldiers and retainers. That's not when the the invasion happened. The invasion happened about 150 years earlier. The Amorites were already well entrenched in the area. They just hadn't made their power move yet. When they made their power move, they basically told Amraphel Hammurabi that, hey man, you, you can continue to you can continue to run Babylon. We're not here to take your throne. We're, we're here to set up set up our trade empire because that's what they did from their capital city of Mari in the kingdom of Mitanni. From there, they sent out their satellite garrisons to Lower Egypt and Hittite Anatolia, Hattusas, and many other places besides like Joppa and Argos. So I have mentioned many times to you guys in my other videos about the mysterious Heliolithic Maritime Empire. This is them. This is who they are. They have, we have never lost these histories. They have been concealed as something else and called Israelites. And there's a reason for that. So, but news came to Babylon eventually of, the, of these people. They were numerous as the stars for multitude, and they were already entrenched in Hattusis, in Byblos, in Ugarit, in Bashan, in Argob, in Aram, in Syria, Canaan, Philistia, Lower Egypt, Libya. Crete, Sardinia, they had, it was known, they, they had basically taken over every coast of the Mediterranean and Aegean. So this was a mariner race of scholars, of warriors, of tradesmen. Very rapidly, the Amuru entered and quickly overran the Near East. In the Peloponnesus at Argos, the Anakim, under their king, Inachus, they built a major Mediterranean power base. It is largely understood and is even published by Robert Graves in his epic works, The White Goddess and the Greek Myths. Huge scholarly books on pre-Greek and Greek antiquities that this figure, Anakis, was named after Anak if he wasn't Anak himself. Okay, now... For 23 years, the Westerners, the Amuru, people of tall stature, bearded, they took over all the kingdoms of the Near East, the Aegean, Lower Egypt, and much of the coast of the Mediterranean. They forged the Heliolithic Maritime Empire with shipping guilds and immense navies. Foreigners would come to their navies and ship, and ship crews, and they would eventually call them in the ancient records of the world all the way, all the way to Homer's Iliad. They would know them by the name of the Danan. In the 23rd year of Abram, the Amorites defeated the Elamites, a destructive fallout from the sky, then vaporized the cities of Pakistan and India in the Harappan Mohenjo Daro civilization. Mohenjo Daro, the city, was laid waste. Harappa was laid waste. The port city of Larrick, earthquake, earthquake and fallout from the sky, uh, laid waste. The cities of Sumer were laid waste, but Babylonia was unaffected. Akkad, the cities of Akkad were gone, they had collapsed. Then this great devastation passed over the desert and then struck the cities of Adma, Zeboam, Sodom, and Gomorrah. Listen, this isn't a fairy tale. Amazingly, the small community of Zela was in the path of destruction and it was totally untouched. How did over 20 metropolises of the ancient world in the Near East get vaporized from the sky in a arc, in a path of destruction called the evil wind in ancient texts. Obliterated cities killed people instantly. Some people had to jump into rivers to escape the burning. And they were far away. But how did all these cities get obliterated? But one small community named Zela was totally untouched and it was in the middle of the path of destruction. I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you how because I've told you guys many times there's nothing to fear about 2040. There's nothing to fear about Nemesis X object in 2046. Those people had built for themselves a community that was insular. It was completely insulated from the outside world. They did not fear anything going on around them. They had built their own little micro universe and they were rewarded for that. It's just, it's just a lesson from history. Zayla survived. So 
like I said, this is no fairy tale, guys. It's no fiction. It's not a myth. Scholars are in agreement that something terrible happened. The ancient lamentation texts of Sumer have been excavated, and many of them have been published by Zechariah Sitchin, and in this, he did a very good job of revealing their contents. They're harrowing, harrowing. And you guys know it takes a lot for me to compliment Zechariah Sitchin. So they describe a terrible disaster. It's called the evil wind, and it burned everything in its path. At Mohenjo Daro, Russian archaeologists were stunned to excavate down to the street level and find human skeletons that were still holding hands as if they were watching their doom approach. Not only that, but the radioactivity, the radioactive uh, uh, the area itself is 50 times more radioactive than it's supposed to be, than normal. This has been scientifically documented about Mohenjo Daryl, about this destruction. That's crazy. There's a lot about this in David Hatcher Childress's books too, man. He he, he cites all the sources, goes into it. It's a, uh, he even shows pictures of the skeletons, some of them holding hands. It's something, man. It's something. I haven't seen anything that graphic since I've seen the, 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 uh, the skeletons of Pompeii and Herculaneum that were excavated and what they looked like. Some people holding dogs on leashes and all that. Yeah, it was crazy. Some people still laying in their beds beds together when they were completely asphyxiated and smothered and died. Yeah. Well, this destruction happened in the year 1849 BC. This was the old world year of 2046. That's when this destruction happened. Now, for our instruction, I should I should I should not have to tell you what I've already concluded in so many other uh, published books, articles, and, and videos about 2046 from wholly independent, you know, data sets and basically unrelated to this calendrical parallel. But you know, this is, you know, in the old world's calendar, this destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah did happen in the year 2046, and in eschatology, which is which is a science of prediction about future events, largely from the the sacred the sacred writings we do find a reference in the that that in the last days society will be destroyed as a new Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, if the past is a predicate for the future, then I'm 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 betting my money that 2046 is the date that the Sodom and Gomorrah elements of our societies will be removed. So what it, what's best for you and I is to find communities that we can build and grow together and we can all form our little zealas all over all over the world and not have to worry about it so uh woo. you guys know Texas gets hot I got two ACs in this building I just can't have one in here tried everything but it just totally messes up my audio so I'm almost done with this. We'll start questions and answers. But the vast destruction further solidified the power structure of the Amuru, who by the date were now running an empire from their capital city in the kingdom of Mitanni. This city was called Mari. It has been found and excavated. Now, the scribes of Genesis were Jewish in Babylon in the 6th and 5th century BC, and they tried, they tried to hide the pedigree of Abraham in various ways. The Jewish hatred for Westerners had them covering up the evidence of their Amorite parentage. They had Abram's purchase, the base, listen, they had Abram purchase the Amorite burial cave at Machpelah to bury his wife, Sarah, Sarai, from the Amorites instead of inherit it by right. They describe Abram as a stranger when he moved to the land, to the city of Kirjath Arba. But all biblical scholars, scholars, they know that the translation of Kirjath Arba is city of Arba. And in the Old Testament, Arba is the father of Anak. Father of the Anakim. He was a Muru. He was a Westerner. Fantastic evidence of the Jewish lies interpolated into the Old Testament is found in the death of Nimrod. The former giant slayer made king who lost his empire and then died in a boar attack in a marsh is a tradition that belongs to over 30 ancient gods. It is a story so famous from the ancient world that the Jewish scribes did it. What they did is absolutely astonishing in boldness and deceit. In my book, 
King of the Giants, Mighty Hunter of World Mythology. You can see it on Gumroad. I think I only sell it for three or four bucks. But in that book, I show a long list of ancient gods around the world who all died in a hunting accident involving a boar in a marsh. In the book of Jasher, written by Jewish scribes, we find a story about Esau. He was disguised as a boar. He lured Nimrod into a marsh in Lebanon, the Huel Marsh. Esau wanted to prove that he was a better hunter than the mighty hunter Nimrod of Genesis. Esau disguised himself as a boar and killed King Nimrod and then barely escaped with his life. When he reached his brother Jacob, he was exhausted. In Genesis, the lie is completed. The Jewish scribes wrote in Genesis that Esau came in famished and sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of porridge. In this way, the Jews began to grant themselves into, excuse me, I'm jumping, I'm moving ahead. Okay, you know what? It, basically, in this way, they began, they began to insert themselves into the narrative of Israel, the Westerners. So, the very people who would be called Israelites in the Bible, but were never called Israelites in real history. So, um, this is just, it blows my mind, this, 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 this Jewish scribal deception. They wanted you to make the connection between what the story in the book of Jasher, but they didn't want to say the story in the book of Genesis. They just wanted to provide the evidence of it because it's very powerful when something is shown to you in part, but the pieces are there for you to put together. It's an excellent way for propaganda. So, anyway... Even the Hindu scholars knew nothing of these lies added to the histories. For to them, Brahma and Saraswati were, were well known. Abram and Sarah, but they had no sons named Jacob or Esau. Those are all Jewish invention. It's pure fiction. The fictions of the Jewish scribes, they, they were continued through the Old Testament. The Israelites are moved into Egypt in the biblical narrative, but in truth, the Westerners occupied Lower Egypt. They had built Memphis, which was later called Heliopolis. Heliopolis is city of the sun. Remember, these were the Heliolithic maritime empire people, the Westerners from the ancient Americas. Now, this is why tobacco and corn and so many different American products never found anywhere else in the world are found all through lower, lower Egypt tombs. So, yeah, this is this is this is very common. This is very common in archaeology. There are mysteries about how American things ended up. Pipe tobaccos, uh, it's crazy. So, um, but but the Westerners already occupied Egypt. You know you know of them as the Hyksos, the Hyksos dynasty, the Shepherd Kings. It's a dynasty well known to scholars as having its origin with who? Canaanites in Syrians, Phoenicians, who? Amuru, Western Semites. Some some call them Northwestern Semites. Some scholars do. In the biblical narrative at this time, the deception is continued when it, when it reads that when Jacob stole the blessing of Esau, he fled to the house of Eber. This is also a Jewish deception. Why Eber? I'll tell you why. Eber is the origin of the word Hebrew. And the scribes want you to associate this individual to Abraham. Remember, hey, remember the passage I read to you out of this 1893 Bible? They were very, very clever to insert that Abram the Hebrew was dwelling in the Amorite field of Mamre, and his and his confederates were were Eshol and Aner and all these other Amorites. They threw the word Hebrew in there, knowing you would make the association between the two. This is a very common scribal practice. It's done everywhere. This is why when they invented the Moses epic. You can see that there's a huge epic. It's called an epos. The whole, the whole number, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, all this stuff about Moses. But then after that, there seems to be a disconnect throughout the entire Old Testament because now every reference to Moses looks like a computer template. As saith 
the Lord God to Moses, as saith the Lord God to Moses, or as in the days of Moses, or as in the days of Moses, or as Moses speaketh. These three terms are found many, many times in the Old Testament, but there's no more stories about Moses, anything Moses ever said, no quotes from Moses, nothing. It's a scribal technique. The story of Moses is no longer necessary. It was just an epic. It wasn't true. But to perpetuate the deception in all these later books of the prophets, which don't know anything about a Moses or anything, they had to add these, what scholars call interpolations. It's just little prepositional phrases and little fragments that will get you to make the association between this later text and, may, and get you to believe that it has something to do with this text over here. Very common practice. The Jews are not the ones that, that were the only ones to do this. So anyway, that's what they did when they said Abraham the Hebrew in that Genesis text because they wanted you later to, to, to make that connection. So books like the Book of Jasher, the Book of Jubilees, these books were provided for that reason, to, to give support to a, fic, a fictitious narrative. So, uh, clever. It's just clever. So anyway, I just, I don't want to discourage people, but... I've told you guys over and over, the Bible is a book of good and evil, and it's up to you to find it, whatever it is you're looking for. It's a, it's a, I, I would even go as far to say it's a supernatural book, but we live in a simulation, so being inside of a simulation, it wouldn't be hard to for an AI system to create such a fantastic template and insert all these deceptions into otherwise actual historical events. It wouldn't be hard at all. So... From the beginning, there were two trees in Eden. One was of life and one was of good and evil. From the very beginning. That's how Genesis starts. The fiction is finalized in that Jacob, check this out, a fictional character who never existed, has his name changed to Israel. That's the nail on the coffin on the, on the deception. This was how the Jews who were not of a Muru pedigree, grafted themselves into the historical narrative of the Israelites. By changing the name, they invented a people based off an actual real people that existed. Remember, anytime you're going to lie to somebody, if you want them to believe it, you need to mix it with enough facts. Because people finding out the facts are real will assume the fictions are too. Yeah, there, there's experts at this. There are. You guys all know them. Yeah, they're on TV every day. ABC, NBC, CBS, BBC, CNN. You already know who they are. They're experts at it. All right. So, I don't want to go too much on uh, too much on that, but these historical people were the Amuru. They were the Westerners. They were the house of Anak. They were the descendants of the Anuna. That's who these people are. All throughout the biblical story of Solomon and King David, there's special mention of all the loyal who? Read read the Old Testament and go through everything about King Solomon and, and King David, and you are going to be swamped with references to who are the most loyal soldiers, servants, followers, and cities to Solomon and David. They're Amorites. They're Hittites. Oh, yeah. Total flip, game flip here. So, uh, they're Amuru, they're Westerners, they're Phoenicians, Sidonians, Tyrians. Yeah, Bible is very clever in, in areas switching over to geo, geopolitical names instead of racial pedigree titles. So, it does it all the time. It's talking about the same people, though. Now, remember, the Bible states that the Israelites were fathered by an Amorite and a Hittite. In fact, the Amuru of Mari, of Mitanni, the kingdom of Mitanni, the center of Western Semitic culture and empire, and the Hittites of Hattusas often exchanged diplomats and even princes and princes, princesses among each other and Egypt, the Hyksos dynasty. I'm not making this up. This is in any, any scholarly monograph or, or book about the Near Eastern studies is going to tell you this. It's widely known. Now, uh, this is why so many so many historians believe that Queen Nefertiti was an Amorite. She was of the kingdom of Mitanni. 
but there really was no distinction between the royal houses of the Amorites of Mori, of Babylon, and of Hattusis, the Hittites. They were all the same family as the, the shepherd kings, the Hyksos of, of Lower Egypt. Remember, the shepherd kings never ruled all of Egypt. There's always been two Egypts. It's the Egypt of the mariner, the sea kings, that that only mattered to the Amuru, and that's the one that hugged, that basically hugged the delta, because the delta gave them access to the sea. All right, this ruling case of Westerners, they spread throughout the Near East. They were the Israelites of the ancient world of the Old Testament. This whole series of books is just rewritten series of records that were altered to include the ancestors of the Jews into a culture for which they never belonged. My videos, the Dark Scriptures playlist, I show you how far they went in perpetuating this deception. It goes deep, my friends. It goes very, very deep. So let me wrap this up before we start Q&A. The Amuru were a mariner race. They were the dreaded marines of the ancient world. After the flood, rulers of the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, the Aegean, and the Mediterranean. As Anakim, they were associated with their pre-flood forebears, the Anunnaki, who before the flood came from vast, from a vast sea in ships led by a commander named Oannes. They stormed the ancient shores of Egypt under the leadership of Means. Yeah, Manashtu a mariner race of gigantic bearded conquerors. All these elements are all found in the Old Testament linked to the origin of the Israelites. The Jewish scribes altered the details, but they kept the denominators in their tale of the Exodus. It has always troubled scholars that, that 40 years is an impossibly long time to wander in a wilderness for such a short trip from Lower Egypt to Canaan, their neighbors, their neighbors. It doesn't take 40 years. It wouldn't even have taken a third of a year. You can walk it. Yeah, it's crazy. Most people don't realize how close they are. The biblical world was very small compared to the world that we, we've come to recognize. And the route doesn't make sense either. It turns sharply far to the south to a place called Ezean Geber, or backbone of a giant a place on the coast where the Israelites supposedly rested after escaping Egypt. Further, in the biblical story, the Jewish fictional King Solomon from the, from the Persian Suleiman, remember the Jews were captives in Persia for a while. That's where they got this story. So they ruled Egypt, they ruled Israel, and occupied the city of Ezean and Geber having a fleet of ships built there that were engaged in maritime trade with a very distant country called Ophir, where there is gold. This is genius. To weave in true historical data with a fictional narrative is very convincing because when people learn that one or two facts uh, are, are correct, they assume that it's all correct and that is the intent. The Israelites never passed through Ezean and Geber in the far south. That was the landing, the fleets of the Amuru, after the flood when they invaded in the Near East. Backbone of a giant is a reference to their gigantic pedigree compared to the locals who were of very small stature. Ophir is not where Solomon obtained gold from because Solomon didn't exist. Ophir is where the fleets of the Amuru when many of them left their ancient civilization in South America, now called Peru. Ophir is Peru, where the bearded Spaniard descendants of the Amuru, thousands of years later, would find gold everywhere spread through the Inca cities. The past is a predicate for the future. The sea kings of the Amuru are the true identity of the scribes hid behind the narrative of the Israelites. They were a culture of inventors, a warrior aristocracy. They were a law and order civilization, leaving ordinances and law codes everywhere. Law code of Hammurabi, anybody? It's famous. So, also translated in 1901. 
They eased the ancient Near Eastern patriarchal animus against the goddess worshippers. Excellent administrators, builders of infrastructures, they were the backbone of civilization. They were the Heliolithic maritime empire, and they grew all-powerful and rich. They grew haughty. They lost their way. They became too powerful. And in the year 1687 BC, their worldwide domination ended in an epic destructive cataclysm that history has, has re preserved known as the Ogygian Deluge. It was 552 years after the Great Flood. The Phoenix had returned. Our histories are written from an anti-Westerner perspective, a pro-Jewish rendition that totally ignores the facts of this mighty people. Internet searches of Amuru will search cure for you a sanitized version of a small kingdom that flourished in the 14th to 12th centuries BC, and this is complete misrepresentation. Imagine historians 2,000 years from now describing the United States in the 1850s and making no mention whatsoever to the technologically advanced civilization that we have become in 2022. Imagine that, because that's exactly what's being presented about the Israelites. The Amuru built and, and occupied the great cities of Ugarit, of Kadesh, the holy city, the true capital of ancient Israel. Mari, Babylon, Hattusis, I mean, Argos, Joppa, Jericho, and they occupied Egypt for centuries called the Shepherd Kings, the Hyksos. The Amuru were spread through Canaan, Syria, Philistia, Bashan, Argob, Urartu, Babylonia, Assyria. They were one people, Westerners, who came to be associated with the places they occupied. No different than New Yorkers, Californians, Virginians, Texas, and Rhode Islanders are all Americans today. The mighty people are identified in the Old Testament as both the origin of the Israelites and the enemy of the people of Judah, the worshipers of Yahweh. Listen, the learned scholar Albert T. Clay, over a century ago, he came to a lot of these conclusions. He shows that a wealth of stories that became the background to the epics and traditions of the ancient Near East, they didn't happen in the Near East. They were of Amorite origin and were imported from a very distant land. We have candidates for the origin of Tartarus or the Far West. Ancient Ireland and Britain, Cornwall, Wales, Scotland, the Isles were anciently populated and with a widespread infrastructure. There was a continuation of this same culture in Spain, anciently called Gaul. Uh, there's been recent excavations of that as well, some really interesting architecture. But by this time, Stonehenge 1 and Newgrange were just a couple of megalithic sites that were already over a thousand years old, having been built under the vapor canopy. It was the tall, bearded sea kings of antiquity who were remembered by all these cultures that fashioned religious beliefs based on the return of Bokika, the return of Viracocha, the return of Kulkakan, the return of Quetzalcoatl. The, uh, man, you, already, you, guys know, you guys know the whole list. It's a... Uh, all these ancient American American gods, Votan, are they all they were all waiting on their return. They were described as Caucasian, they were described as bearded, they were described as mariners, and all these ancient ancient American cultures were waiting for them to return. The reason they were waiting is because that's where the Amuru departed. This is the story of ancient Israel. This is why the Abrahamic covenant reads the way it does. When you isolate the particulars in the Abrahamic covenant, you will see an entire list of prophecies about what these people will do all the way to till the, till the last days. And only a mariner race could ever achieve what the Abrahamic covenant predicts in the book of Genesis. Those prophecies could never be fulfilled by many of the cultures that live in this world because they do not leave their geographical boundaries. Westerners, the Amuru, the descendants of the Anuna have always been a mariner race. They have always been the builders of infrastructures. They have always also been invaders they, they invade, build an infrastructure, put all, all the elements of civilization out there, and they're also stuck on a cycle as well. Their cycle is, they, is that they get too powerful and power breeds corruption. 
And when corruption becomes ubiquitous, the phoenix retards that development. That's 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 the presentation, guys. That's the presentation. I need some water. And we can do Q&A till the wheels fall off. All right, let's see here. Don't forget those links too, guys. In the uh, don't forget those links that I that I got in the um for the chat and all that, guys. I, you know when I'm running my mouth, I I see the chat going by. I just can't. I'm not really paying attention to it though, so I'm sorry. Truth is knowledge. Thank you. I see y'all doing some talking over here. Optimus Grime, Julius, thank you. Tree of life being booby trapped. Yeah, well, uh, that's a good one. That's a good one, man. I don't know about that one. Know about that one? Okay, so do we have any questions relative to the presentation, or are we just going to freestyle questions? It doesn't really matter to me. It don't matter to me. We can do both. Remember, I need my questions in all caps because that makes you stand out. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Remind everybody, all caps. Uh, Sanity Fair. I'm sorry, I've never even heard of the Foundlings. I don't know. I don't know what that information derives from. I don't, even, I don't even know anything about the foundlings. <clears throat> That's a good question. Why are there skulls artfully arranged under the catacombs in Europe? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, are you referring to the areas where the human skeletons have not been found? It's just, just a collection of skulls? I don't know, but uh, uh, one of the cons had one of the cons had a habit of building pyramids out of skulls, but I don't I don't know about why in the catacombs of Rome. I don't know. Being in the catacombs, I'm pretty sure that that's probably where they were killed. We say catacombs now, but at one time th those were just the surface streets and buildings of ancient Rome. Got me with the found the foundlings. I don't know. HWM Liberty. Robert Seifer came on at the same time again. You guys need to coordinate. I like Robert Seifer. Oh yeah. Only only when I first started my YouTube journey was I put off by Robert Seifer, and I've already explained that in videos because he comes from an academic background, and as a stated anthropologist, uh, I know for a fact. Many of the tenets of anthropology, and I've revealed them in my published books and videos, are absolute bullshit. Because in order to put out many of the historical things they need to put out to have you believe in their anthropological theories, they have you have to assume a lot of things to be true that have already been disproven in other fields of science. So, uh, but I have been educated. And it took me listening to someone critique a Robert Seifer video. I contacted Robert Se Robert Seifer and said, hey, man, I'm really sorry. I misjudged you. But I came into contact with your material because somebody put out a video that was talking real bad about one of your presentations and who you are. So I listened to it, and his presentation was so full of holes, and it was so terribly put, put, put together. I'm surprised anybody took it seriously. So I even left him a comment and telling him the error of his ways and that you really need to know your material before you critique somebody. So, but it doesn't even matter. People put out YouTube videos just, just to, they have absolutely no value of their own to provide to the world. So they attack those of us who do have value and that we're trying to share. So, I mean, there's people who got YouTube videos about me. I do not care. Nothing will ever stop what I'm doing except, you know, exiting this avatar. So, uh, I don't care what they say. I believe I believe strongly in P.T. Barnum's uh, philosophy that it doesn't matter what they say about you as long as they spell your name right. 
So bad publicity is often good publicity because I've had negative comments on other channels that actually directed traffic by intelligent people who wanted to see for your, for see for themselves. And then they come to my channel and they realize, damn, this guy is not saying, saying what they're saying he's saying. So yeah, happens all the time. So yeah, uh, I like Robert Seifer. I've already listened to about seven or seven or nine of his videos already. I listen to videos on YouTube when my hands are doing something. When I when I have to be doing something with my hands, and uh, I, that's when I listen to videos. But yeah, I like Robert Seifer. And yes, we do have a lot of the same beliefs. I don't know. I, I seriously doubt that we, we've researched the same materials. It's uh, but but yeah, we have we have we're coming from the same place. Wendy Flores. Well, <clears throat> casting lots is not something I, I would really specialize in that. I, I just don't. It was just, uh, there, there's so many different ways. There's so many different cultures that did it. There's so many different tiles that were used. Uh, just like the Futhark, the, the, the Nordic runes. I mean, those are considered casting, casting uh, the tiles too. It's just, uh, there's so there's no one culture that had a single method of doing that. They're so they're so different, Wendy. Hell, I can't even see your your, your question no more. Oh yeah, yeah, casting lots. Yeah, well, I do know that there's a story about uh, an old story about how Uranus. And his sons all came together, and it was Noah and his sons, Ham, Sham, Japheth, all that. But there's the same stories also preserved in the old Achaean, and the old Greek stories, where uh, under Uranus, who was Noah, and his sons, they cast lots for different parts of the earth, and and it fell upon one of them uh, uh, that they they took Tartarus. Well, at the time, Tartarus meant the far west. Tartar means means west west. Well. Tartarus means the far west, but it was it, it had it's attached to it's attached to the idea of the far west being a very sunless sunless region. It was considered to be a curse. This later in time was uh because the three brothers cast lots and one got the middle of the earth, one got the the far north, and another one got got the east, and another one got the far west. Well, later on, the far west became identified as the underworld, but it was never that way in the the original traditions the original traditions it was the far west that was the ancient americas that's who that person got so. all right thank you mary austin you used all capitals to tell me it was a fantastic presentation i appreciate it energy flow tribe yes yes Yep, the sea people are the descendants of the Anuna. The Israelites are the descendants of the Anuna. The maritime, uh, the Heliolithic maritime empire are the descendants of the Anuna. The the uh, the mariners of ancient Americas that that they were all the locals were all waiting for to return were descendants of the Anuna. And before you before you you know get too confused almost everybody in the world today has a nuna blood this is what the abrahamic covenant was about this is the brahmic covenant it was a covenant to all that's why it was open to all mankind it was only the jews rewriting the old testament that later uh, when they wrote all the yahweh passages they basically they basically secured god for themselves and then uh treated the rest of the world as cattle kind yeah the uh the more pure spiritual materials in Genesis and Revelation, because the second book of the Bible starts a whole nother version of history, which is 100% pro-Jewish. Yeah, the, uh, the covenant of Yahweh is nothing like the covenant of, of Abraham or, or Abram. Yeah, nothing like that. Totally, They're totally different. They even read totally different. I mean, totally different. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the second one's full of curses and, and, and threats and all that kind of stuff. For the, the Genesis, the, that one doesn't have all that. Uh, 
I don't know anything about the tree of life being booby trapped. I believe it's a metaphor. If you want to get super technical, when you say tree of life being booby trapped, then you're telling me the great pyramid of Egypt is booby trapped. And that right there is not a stretch of imagination. It very well could be. I know King Tutankhamun's, uh, King, King Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922, Howard Carter found out real quick it was booby trapped. No, our cloaked unseen world. When I was in prison, I never came across any Tesla material. I really didn't. Just, just obscure references in some of the old books that I have read where they had talked about him. Uh, I did, though. I did see a, an interesting book that had that cited a bunch of newspaper articles uh, from 1890s, uh, 1910 area, all about Tesla, 1920s, I think, too. But uh, the whole book was nothing but newspaper articles that was citing all this stuff about Nick, Nikola Tesla and Edison. So, yeah, it's a, uh, anyway, I think a lot of the Tesla stuff's been scrubbed from the history books, but you still have microfish. You can still look up old newspapers. Like you, you can go through all the uh, archives of different major newspapers that have been around for 200 years and you can still see all that stuff. I don't know if they've scrubbed that yet. Joy White, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I believe one, I believe that there are exceptions to every rule. There are always exceptions to every single rule. East is up. J Dreamers. Hey, how you doing, man? I didn't even know you were in the chat. I can't miss your little sigil. Your little sigil. That little uh, jellyfish. Yeah, man. You should never change that, man, because that, that is you. That jellyfish is you, Jay Dreamers. Okay, Jay Dreamers, what are your thoughts on Rikyon, the first pharaoh appointed by Osiris and Jasher? Listen, my brother, in the book of Jasher, the very first ruler of Egypt was the father of Osiris. And in the text, in Book of Jasher, that first king of Egypt is named Anam, A-N-A-M. And in the Jasher text, it says that Anam actually came from Babylonia. He came from Babylonia, settled in Egypt, and his son became basically like the first pharaoh. What's interesting is Anam is the reverse of Mina. And Mina is the old name for means in Greek. It has been identified by scholars as being a reference. Mina is a reference to means. Who is Man Manishtu? You're asking about you're asking about the grandson, Rikion, who was the son of Osiris. I don't know much about him. I can't really remember that passage because I was so excited about finding that Anum of Babylonia, who founded the rulership of Egypt and passed it to his son Osiris actually came from Babylon and that he was the means of the ancient Greek stories about well, when, when the civilization of, of Egypt was founded. To find that just shocked the hell out of me because it absolutely confirmed what Professor Waddell said. And Professor Waddell never cited the book of Jasher. It wasn't one of his source materials. So I was so I was like a puppy just wagging my tail when I found that little little piece because that's exactly what Professor Waddell says. He said that Manashtu means was in Babylonia and he traveled to Egypt and he invaded. And only centuries later was his name changed to to uh, Anum and or Mina. But you have to understand there are many, many examples from ancient Egypt where Western Semitic Western Semitic is the exact reverse of Egyptian. We have several example, examples. Noph becomes Fien. We're talking about the Phoenix. In Egyptian, it's Noph. But in Greek, it's Fien, Phoenix. So we have uh, the Greek goddess Athene. It's, uh, it's Athene by Western Semitic standards. But it's Neith in ancient Egypt, the goddess Neith. We have many examples where the exact reverse is found. And that's because that's because these two civilizations wrote in different ways. One wrote from right to left. One wrote from left to right. Scribes always had a problem with this. And what they did is they they translated the idea. The syntax was translated 
correctly, but a lot of the words were left, well, were just flipped over backwards. They didn't know, they didn't know better. So, and this isn't my discovery. There have been many books published in the 1800s about the mirror effect between ancient Egypt and ancient Greek. It says, all you do is flip the name and it's, just, it's over here in uh, uh, the other culture. Same thing with means. The reverse, of, the reverse of Mina is Anum. So, thanks for that question, man. But you would have to educate me on on Rock Rakion Rock Rakion, because I do remember the name. I don't remember any historical details. I could probably pull out my Chronicon and read a little something about it, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. So you have stumped me, my dear brother. You're gonna make me. You're gonna make me go go into my research notes and find out what's up with this dude. You know what? YouTube moves my chat when I when I hang out in the in the same area for too long. That's what it did. It shot me down. So I lost my place. I saw the Hellenic Wolf in there somewhere. Another one of my moderators. I've done a I've done a video with him in the past. We're gonna do another one. Four jacks. Yeah, I'm going to have to go ahead and throw my dogs in the video. That's a lot of y'all asking about the dogs. Yes, absolutely. Bamba. Uh, Bamba Ba. How do you say your name? Bam. Bamba Ba. All right, whatever. Bamba Ba. Jason, were the Amuru in Mauritania? Absolutely. King Juba was descended from, from, from these people. Absolutely. I've read all, I've read all about King Juba and Mauritania and Mauritania and their conflict, their conflict with the Romans. Uh, Atlantis could very well be, be in that area. Although if we're going to stick with the, with the narrative, Atlantis must be underwater now, which isn't a stretch. Archaeologists, archaeologists of the Mediterranean area, Mediterranean area have widely published that there are over 300 sunken cities in the Mediterranean. So any one of those could be Atlantis. But the actual disaster was the 14th century BC. Let's see. I don't know what the death wind had. Hey, Jeff Griffey, I ain't seen you in a while, man. Old Facebook buddy. Yes, the Albanian race. Yes, the Albanians are very old. Very old. I have a lot in Chronicon. I have a lot. You guys have to understand this presentation did not go into detail. No, I could never, I could never. This video was, was here, 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 here's all the package truth. Here you go. That's not, that's not how it works. This presentation was to gain you an awareness that we have this data and that all you have to do is look that, uh, but it takes a lot more than a video to present something as fact. That's why I've provided Chronicle. That's why you have to do your own. Sometimes you got to do you got to do your own digging. You got to you got to the books I tell you guys to read. You need to go. You need to go read them. They're packed. They're packed. There are no authors today that wrote like Professor Waddell, Thor Heyerdahl, Harold T. Wilkins, Gerald Massey, Francis Barrett. There are no authors living today that wrote like these men did, that actually processed information like these men did, that put all this stuff together. These men did not have access to internets. They had access to a lot of old books that we don't have access today. So this is why I value these authors. This is why I cite them so, so heavily. All right.
Michelle Welling, what evidence do we have that we are actually in the year 2022? Well, first of all, the year 2022 doesn't mean anything. It's just the the year that follows on this old Gregor Gregorian system that was that was invented to cover up a Phoenix disaster in the year 522 AD. I have a video that goes into a lot of detail about what the Roman Catholic Church did when they implemented this new system. The real year on the old world's calendar that we still today, that's unbroken, no matter what calendars you follow going forward and backward in time, none of that matters because there is an unbroken timeline. The Anno Mundi timeline. Annus Mundi is the older version. The Annus Mundi timeline is unbroken. You don't have to worry about a year zero or none of that stuff in the, when BC hits AD. None of that stuff. That's all muddling the waters. That's all confusing. A very simple calendar is the Annus Mundi calendar. And this is the year 5916. And I have a 500 page book called Chronicon that shows you exactly how we get to this date. So, yeah, I, I stand 100% behind. I, I fear absolutely no critique in my calendrical research, none. I have that much data to back up all that. 2022 doesn't mean nothing. The elite could tell us it's 2018 right now, and it wouldn't bother me a bit because it's not the Anno Domini calendar that I give a damn about. It doesn't mean anything. 5916 is where we're at right now. 5934 is when the phoenix returns. 59, 5940 is when Nemesis X object happens. And then basically the apocalypse just unfolds after that. Okay, Jay, Jay McLeod, can you elaborate more on Peru? I know only a little about the history of Peru and the and the um, Amorites. All right, listen. Uh I showed a book in another video. I have it back here on my, on my shelf by Brian Forrester that shows the technolithic and heliolithic architecture from, from ancient South America, from Cuzco, from Puma Punca, San Cu uh, uh, I can't even pronounce it. I want to say San Cuniathan, but that's that's a Phoenician historian. It sounds like that, though, but it's this huge Alentambaro, gigantic megalithic uh, cultures. Listen, this, this race of mariners occupied that area of the world in Peru, and they're very well remembered. They left their architecture behind at Puma Punca, at Tiwanaku, at Cuzco, at Machu Picu. They left all this stuff. That's why so many of the ruins in ancient South America look identical to the ones at Giza. Very, very old blocks. You can't even fit a razor blade between between the things. This has been the uh, there are there are better researchers that I that have been on site boots on the ground that have studied the studied these things. But they had access to a technology that we don't have today because they were building these structures during a vapor canopy world. After the vapor canopy world was over, there was no longer any technolithic uh, structures being built. They kind of faded into obscurity, although we found some of them. Absolutely geometrically precise, smooth, marble-like like planes. However, the Amuru, not the Anuna, the Amuru were the descendants after the flood of the Anuna who date from before the flood. The Amuru, the Westerners, Western Semites, these people came in and they built a massive infrastructure because they, they still possessed the technical know-how, but they didn't possess the technology. That's why the architecture is no longer technolithic. It is now heliolithic. This is why they were called the Heliolithic Maritime Empire. So heliolithic is cyclopean masonry, giant oblong blocks that are all different sizes, all four, like fit together like a puzzle, but they're super strong because they were building to protect themselves from earthquakes. These are earthquake proof, proof structures. But the cataclysm in 1687 BC, known as the Ogygian Deluge, completely collapsed their entire worldwide trade empire. After that, it was a 25-year darkness where the vapor canopy almost returned and another age of heroes was born. I have a video about that where Hesiod goes into detail uh, when he describes all the ages of the world, but all of a sudden he tucks one in. A little age of heroes, a fifth age is just tucked in and it's never made sense uh, in the context of Greek mythology and history. But it does make sense when you take into consideration that all these cataclysms were phoenix phenomenon episodes. Now we understand why there was an age of heroes and that humans were, were for a very short period of time, everybody born in that 25-year period, 
was heroic, gigantic. Females were now considered sirens and, and Valkyries and, and dryads and nymphs, and they were super tall, and the men were even bigger, and they were heroes, but it, but it was only for those born in that small period of time. Less than 200 years later was the Trojan War, where the last of the giants from that period were, were eliminated. But, uh, yeah, it's... It's it's all it's all, history is fascinating. It's far better than anything Hollywood has been able to produce. History is awesome. But Peru, you'll find a lot of evidence of, of this massive culture in Peru in the writings of da David Hatcher Childress. He has a seven book series called the Lost City series. In the Lost City series, he has one book that is specifically dedicated only to South America. That's how much dad the book's about this thick. Huge, packed with archaeological uh, uh, photographs of things that have been discovered, relics. Uh, reading the books of David Hatcher Childress will bring my videos to life. If you read the books on the lost cities, because he's, he's boots on the ground. That's why I like about Childress. He tells you what the airport ride is like. He tells you about what's going on. When, when you turn the pages, you're there with David going to the ancient sites, talking to taxi cab drivers at a hotel, putting all your stuff up so you can change clothes, get your camera out and go hit the ancient ruins and take pictures. You're there with David. He describes everything. He's been to these places that he publishes books about. Believe me, I, it was very enjoyable when I was in prison because I was there. I traveled the world with David Hatcher Childress. I did. So uh, I highly recommend his books. I have never heard of Ken McClellan YouTube page. Something I need to check into, huh? Could the vapor canopy be the firmament? Yeah, it could, but you have to understand in 2239 BC, the day the sky fell, the day the sun was born, whatever, whatever you want to call it, the vapor canopy or the firmament, whatever, it fell. Hasn't been there since. Almost came back a couple times. 1687 BC and 522 AD. The two times it almost came back. 2040, the very next time Phoenix is here in 18 years, it will come back. That's why that's that's why a lot of the a lot of the things in the book of Revelation don't make sense to us. We read these things and it sounds like really fantastic and all that, but when you reinterpret the apocalypse and and put a vapor canopy back where it's supposed to go and the conditions that occur in a vapor canopy, yeah, now you understand why people why, why people are going through what they're what they're doing the 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 heat factors the 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 darkness the um uh, uh wanting rocks to fall them to kill them because they can't kill themselves yeah it's pretty harrowing for some people I don't know who built the great China, who who built the great wall of China and why I don't know I don't know I do know I do know that the actual, the story that we've been told about the third century BC, second century BC, Chinese emperor, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's, uh, I'm not buying it, but I can't tell you what. And there's, there's other researchers too have done a lot of digging on that. Victoria Z, you'll have to Google Zechariah Sitchin and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because that's the book. It's going to pull up all that stuff about what I'm telling you. And he goes into great detail and describes all of this, what was going on. That was that, that, that right there. I, I'll give Sitchin his props. He did that. It's called the Lamentation Texts. When Sumer, when Sodom and Gomorrah, Sumer, Akit, Harappa, Mahinjadero, Lyric, all that was just tore it was just tore out of tore out of history, completely eliminated. And the one little town, one little old community of Zela survived. Oh, Mish Gleason. Okay, foundlings are orphans from the orphan trains. Listen, I haven't gone into a lot of depth on the 1800s. There were some very anomalous, mysterious things going on, and I have a lot of notes, and I will I will do videos. Uh, I just don't. I'm still. I still haven't seen enough data for me to say the potato famine didn't happen. I still haven't seen that data yet. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm wondering. 
uh, if you if if all these I don't know maybe there was a reset and all the parent all the parents were taken away and the, something had to be done with these children to grow a new world I don't know anything is possible at this time remember I don't believe I don't believe any organic events I believe that that there are major edits that occur and that only in retrospect do we see their evidence so yeah anything's anything's possible at this time. I don't want to say I don't. I just don't want to attribute something as mysterious until I see evidence of it. Listen, I don't know anything about Bulgaria. There's a couple of y'all asking me to look into it, but uh, when it comes when it comes to calendars, there's a few civilizations that claim claim to have calendars that go back a long period of time. I know. Uh, I've never found anything that goes back in the historical record, uh, in in historical documented human history that goes back beyond 5239 BC. I've never found anything. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I just don't see how it could exist. I don't. Uh, I don't know. I know the ancient. Uh, I know ancient Irish traditions. There, there is references that go back to 5200 BC. It almost perfectly lines up with uh, uh, the Anunnaki nerve system of 600 years that goes back that far. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I haven't. No one sent me anything about Bulgarian history. I, I mean, many civilizations have claimed to have, like, like, like Egypt. Egypt claimed to have a history going back all that way, and then you find out that for a couple thousand years of that history. They did not factor time in years. They factored them in months. When you take that in consideration, which the ancient authors said themselves, but they're ignored today. That's what my last video was about. It says, when you take that in consideration, everything is abbreviated and now fits within the archaeological record. This is what archaeologists agree to. They don't agree that anything existed in 10,000 BC. There's not a trace of human architecture in this world that goes back to 9,000 BC or 8,000 BC or 7,000 BC. So, uh, I don't know. But, uh, like I said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary, extraordinary evidence. I am on board with searching, but so far I haven't seen any evidence of it. The people of Bulgaria may have a very ancient history. If it goes back before the vapor canopy, then it's going to be a very old. If it goes to the 45th, 40, 46th, 47th, 48th century BC, that is heroically ancient for any infrastructure, for any uh, people to maintain traditions from. I haven't found anybody who's maintained traditions that long. But if the Bulgarians did, then so be it. I would like to see evidence of that. But to find someone who has an unbroken calendar, it's ridiculous to me because even the Mayan calendar goes back to 3113 BC. That's 5,000 years ago. That's a long time ago. But you know what? The Maya themselves don't date back that far. That means they developed the camera, the calendar in retrospect. Okay, who's to say the Bulgarians didn't either? Who's to say the Bulgarians didn't develop a calendar and just say it began way back over here and begin factoring events? This is why I'm always telling people extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You can say that these things date to those periods, but can you show it? So... I'm, in, I'm interested in looking. If you got stuff in Bulgaria that goes back real far, I need to see those sources. I need to see the provenance of that material. It might surprise me. I might have to do a series of videos on Bulgaria. You might teach me something. Yeah, have you ever heard of the Watchers? Of, yeah, everybody's heard of the Watchers. If, if you're talking about the Watchers of the Book of Enoch, Oh, the Statue of Liberty prophecy. Yeah, that that requires a whole different video. It's way too much, way too much meticulous material to get into. Um, whoever, whoever the true architects are of the Statue of Liberty, it's an absolute prophecy of the year 2052. And I, I I have that in Chronicon. It's in my Chronicon, but I need to do a video about it. But in order in order to do a video about it, I also have to put out the whole history of the dark satellite, which I still haven't done yet. There's just not enough hours in a day, guys. I'm, I'm busy. I really am. I'm busy. But yeah, the the uh, the Statue of Liberty prophecy, the connection to the return of the Seven Kings, the year 2052, and the dark satellite is all connected. It's all one, it's all one, one, uh, uh series. It's all one data set. It's all, it's all together. So I, I would have to put all that together. I go into some detail in my book, uh, Anunnaki Homeworld. 
but I don't go into a lot. Millions of, of skeletons under Paris? Yeah, I prob probably are. Probably are. Probably are. Thank you for hitting that like button, guys. Appreciate that. I really do. Is this a good time to do a live? Because uh, I'm just curious. Thank you, Mark Louie. Yeah, everybody under maritime law. I mean, I, the maritime Helolithic Empire, it's never stopped. Man. All throughout history, it's never stopped. We, guys, guys, what I'm trying to tell you is we are Amuru. That's who we are. Marjorie Ford is asking me, who is Melchizedek? Okay, look, the very oldest reference to Melchizedek happens to be in the same book that J Dreamers just quoted, which is the book of Jasher. So, uh, um, the very oldest reference to Melchizedek. So, and remember, in the biblical narrative, the book of Jasher is older than the Old Testament itself. Did you know that? Yeah. The book of Jasher does not cite Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's just the opposite. The Old Testament cites the book of Jasher twice. So, we have in the book of Jasher, we have this rabbinical writing of the history of the world, borrowing chronologies from ancient Babylon, which are very good. I like them. And uh, I really like the way they put all these chronological deals because they when they wrote the book of Jasher, they wanted to take an accurate chronology of the history of the world, and they did. They nailed it everywhere. Book of Jasher, is chronologically, is one of the best books ever written. It's fantastic. As far as the how many years were between all these different historical events, but they had to get it meticulously perfect because of the deceptions they wanted to weave in there. Okay, that's why they did it. In the book of Jasher, we find out that Shem was so ancient after the flood when he died that there was a ceremony created that um, he was regarded as having no beginning and no end because he was born on the other side of the flood. And he was already so old, and the flood was so many years ago, by the time he died, he was a priest in Canaan at, at, at the city of Zedek. And uh, Mel Melki is just from Melkarth. It means king. It means king. He was the king of Zedek. And he, he is identified in the record as the son of Noah. He is Shem, uh, the father of the, of the, of the Shemite, Semites. And uh, patriarch of Eber, Hebrews. So that, that's the that's where the order of Melchizedek comes from. It's the reason why when it says order of Melchizedek has no beginning and no end, it's a reference to ancient Shem who was born before the flood, meaning he had no beginning and he had no end. It was later attributed in the New Testament to Jesus having no beginning and no end, or basically the Christ. For those of you who don't know, there's a huge distinction between the Christ and the person of Jesus. Many of you believe Jesus was the Christ, and I'm cool with that because in the end, it doesn't really matter. But uh, this is why the writings of Paul are fundamentally different than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Paul knew of Christ and Christ crucified, which was a concept, but, but Paul never mentioned any personal details about Jesus, never once quoted Jesus, never cited a miracle of Jesus, never, nothing, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, the tears, uh, all nothing. Paul knew, Paul did not know a personal Jesus. Paul knew Christ and Christ crucified, which was a very old concept way before the time Jesus was supposed to have lived. All right. Uh, is there a relation between Phoenix and the Phoenician? I believe there is. Thales, Thales of Miletus, according to the book of Herodotus, written 455 BC. In that book, it says Thales of Miletus predicted the darkening of the sun two years before it actually happened in the year 583 BC. And it was entered into the Greek Olympiad calendar. Thales got it right. He predicted a, a darkening of the sun. Now, science, historians and scientists, the establishment are going to lie to you, and they're going to say Thales was the first time somebody predicted an eclipse. 
absolute BS. It wasn't a, it wasn't an eclipse. He predicted it two years before it happened. It's almost impossible to predict an eclipse because the actual shadow of an eclipse is just a very tiny, tiny line going across the earth, the shadow of the moon. So yeah, it's a, he didn't predict an eclipse. He predicted something, something far, far different. And I show this in my, my books on the Phoenix, but I'm telling you this story because Herodotus said that Thales of Miletus was a Phoenician by remote descent. And I have shown that a special branch of the Phoenicians called the Danan sailed their way straight out of Mycenae, I mean, straight out of, out of the, of the Aegean into the, uh, into the Trojan War recorded by Homer of Troy. So the Danan left the War of Troy after Agamemnon won and Mycenae and sailed to ancient Ireland. But when they sailed to ancient Ireland, it wasn't no, it wasn't like they had left it over a thousand years before. Ancient Ireland had been overrun, overrun by some giants called the Fearbulgs. And the Fearbulgs the Fearbulgs had beat the Danan when they first landed. So the Danan waited some months, assembled another fleet, and invaded, but they timed their invasion in 1135 BC to mid-May. And as soon as the sun darkening and there was an earth darkened and there was an earthquake, they had their, their they had their priests act like they were performing a ritual, and the Fearbulgs were terrified, thinking that the Tuatha de Danan had just done something to the sun, and they won. It's an old technique. Yes, yes, Phoenician and Phoenix is connected, and it goes back to the to the days of 1687 BC when the Amuru used the sun darkening episode of Phoenix to destroy their enemies in Canaan. This is in the book of Jasher, and I, I've, I've cited that text many times. So, yeah, uh, the, a knowledge of the phoenix has been weaponized in the past, just like the elite. The elite knew it was going to happen in 1902, and they hid. And as soon as they realized it wasn't the big one, they came out with their guns blazing. They came out with all opening up their wallets, big fat wallets, funded all the companies that later became Fortune 500 com companies. They had an edge on everybody else because they knew. And they took their wealth into the underworld. Then they brought it back up. Wow, 1,049 people on, 1,043 likes. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you, guys. I haven't found anything about the planet Maldek. I don't even know what that's a reference to. I mean, it could be the Nemesis X object. I mean, it, the whole stellosphere, the whole sky is simulated, so... Whatever it is, it's a, it's a part of a construct. I would just have to attach a chronology to it. No, no, Rooster M. The tribe of Dan was not an evil people. Remember who's writing this. The enemy of the Amuru was the one that ended up writing the Old Testament as you have it today. See, we haven't done a video and really explained all that. When the Assyrians took the 10 tribes of Israel, the, the last of the, Amur, the Amuru, away into captivity, it allowed the Jewish scribes from Judah to go into the northern city that they hated, Kadesh, and steal their books, their holy books, their scrolls, their libraries, and they changed all these uh, Hurrian, uh, uh, Amuru Amorite names and replaced them with Jewish names, Judahite names, and they rewrote the text in the seventh and sixth century BC. They, yeah, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's harrowing what happened. And then right after that, the Babylonians took them into captivity. So, yeah, the old the Old Testament was written over a fantastically long period of time, and it was redacted, written over and over and over until we got it in its present area. But any references to the tribe of Dan being evil is be, is specifically written by Jewish scribes to make to make you hate on those people. These are the people that founded ancient Ireland. These are the people that trekked all the way across Europe and named the river Danube and, and left Denmark and all these places. D-I-N-D-A-N and D-E-N and Dena 
is all over ancient Europe. It's everywhere. Hundreds of communities, cities, rivers, landmarks all have that root word in there from those people. It's, it's a, they're just a certain group of the mariner of the mariner race that were the Amuru that did a lot of traveling, even in ancient America. No, there's nothing evil about them. There is, a, there is a reference in the Bible, one of the judges, why does Dan remain in ships? Yeah, man, Dan, Dan has always had free spirit. They're explorer race. They are, they are the Danu, the Danan, later known as the Tuathidae Danan. They are the same Danan that entered an ancient Aegean Mycenae. They are the same Danan that sailed right through the pages of Homer's Iliad. Yes, I believe in a creator. I believe in the oversoul. 100%. Yeah, if you, to even ask me that in this video means you're not familiar with my work. You have not watched very many videos. And, I mean, I don't accuse you of anything, but to ask me that, to ask me if I believe in, in God, you don't know me. You know, this must be a very new presentation to you. Let's see. I'm looking for capital letters. I don't know. Roost negative. Yeah, bloodline. I'm a chronologist, guys. I don't know anything about uh, why we have different bloodlines. Old sources like the Mayan Popol Vuh that explains that the gods at different times use different base materials to create different types of humans uh, and put them here all over the world during different times for biosphere, you know, different biospheres. Yeah, to ask me about RH negative, to ask me about O type, O, O, A, 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 B, all that. I said, I'm, this is not my area of expertise. I don't know anything about the blood types. To me, it's not even a mystery. It's not even a mystery because uh, I've already told you, ex nihilo, I believe that whole populations have just been put here, programmed, programmed into being here within, within a millisecond. Very easy. Do not believe in the uniformitarian view. I do not believe at all that we have developed from anything. I believe that we were programmed just like this to be here at this time. Hmm. I believe there is. Wilhelmina. Yeah. The River Danube and Dan, but I just talked about this, so. I probably anticipated you. Suleiman, Amy H.B. Khalil, Solomon of the Bible comes from the Persian Suleiman. Yeah, there's stories about Suleiman the Great. Yeah, that's that's where they got that's where they whole got that whole narrative from. Remember the Jew. The, remember the Jews were in. Uh, thank you, Mad. Uh, the Jews were in. Um, uh, they were captive in Persia for a while, just like they were captive in, 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 in uh, Babylonia. So during their captivities, they always raided the libraries, rewrote things. Yeah, they're, they're busy. They were busy. That's what the Old Testament is about. It's about a people who do not belong in the historical narrative inserting themselves in there and trying to assume some of the greatness of their enemy. Yeah, and then and demonizing their enemy at, at the same time. Yeah, there was nothing evil about the Israelites. There was nothing evil about the Amuru. None, none of that. Nothing e evil about the Amorites. Odinga. Jason, how do you explain the fact the Amuru village is still in northern Uganda? Oh, I wouldn't doubt that a, a bit. I mean, I know if you if you do a deep search, like in William Cordes's book. He's got a bunch of books. And just look up Anak. You will find all throughout Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, Easter Island, uh, all throughout the area where Rongo Rongo was spoken, South America. You will find in Central America, in the Mexico region, you will find Anak everywhere. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, these people were all over the world. They're laying colonies. They're, uh, they were seen as benefactors. Yeah. 
They, they weren't they weren't the conquering come this this I'm not talking about a Saracen invasion of North Africa where they chopped off villagers' arms to make all the youngsters join them in battle to become the Moors so they could train this whole Arabic black army to invade Europe uh, uh, against the white Christians. I'm not talking about that type of invasion. That's what the Saracens did. That's what the Arabian people did to Northern Africa. They went into those village and to create a super army, they, they, they spread Islam all the way, but they did it by force of sword. And within 150 years, they raised a massive army of Moors and they used that army to invade Europe. I'm not talking about that. The, the, the Amuru never did anything like that. They were always seen as benefactors, the builders of infrastructures. Yeah. It's uh, it's totally totally just the opposite. A lot of things you see, live a lot of, when you see people that are vilified in ancient texts, it's normally just the opposite is true. Somebody asking me about Tesla again. I, oh, that's the same thing. I'm, yeah, J Dreamers is gonna have to. J Dreamers is gonna have to educate me on Ricky on. Man, I remember that name too, Ricky on. I'm going to have to get back in my jasher. Hellenic Wolf, there you are, guy. Guys, let's keep it civil. Oh, somebody's acting up in the chat? Yeah, man. I, I'm i not with the negativity at all. Yeah, I've heard of Karen. I've heard of Lamech. I've heard of the Lamech scroll, too. The very unusual birth of his son, he accused his wife of sleeping with angels. Yeah, he was pretty pissed. But it's an old story. It's not just in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That story's told me many, many different accounts. I think the Jewish Haggadah tells it too. Maybe the, the book of Noah, which is now a part of the book of Enoch. Or book of giants, one of them. I'm not talking about the book of giants and the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's different. Part of the book of Enoch was called the, the book of the watchers. There was the book of Noah, the book of giants, and there was something else. But today it's all lumped together as the book of Enoch. Let's see. Shiva Shampoo. Jason, for some reason, some people in the chat are saying that this is not live. I have no idea why they're saying it. I don't know why either because I'm live right now. Mine says live at two hours and one minute. There could have been a there could have been a Wi-Fi break or something, and YouTube has done that before where they'll sever off a video and go ahead and just run that for them. I don't know. I don't know what their settings are, but it's definitely live. Yeah. Yep, Jama Barker. Flags. I, you know what? I have notes on flags. I do have notes. Man, I got to pull those out. I do have notes on all the different flags of the world and showing definitive patterns of ancient pedigree. Yeah, you're right. Modern day European flags show a lot of, of commonality with ancient ancient Mediterranean uh, kingdoms and stuff. That's pretty interesting. Oh, for those who are, who are wondering, somebody asked me earlier about Mauritania. That's a, that's a kingdom that flourished for a while during the Roman period. They're very ancient. Uh, they were peaceful. They're in northern Africa. The, Mauritari the Mauritarians, the Mauritanians, uh, they pulled a genius move and they fooled Rome because they knew Rome was coming to attack them and take their wealth. They built fleets with uh, Libyans and Carthaginians. And they sailed out of the pages of history. Some say that they landed in Spain for a little while, but uh, all the evidence points that they ended up in the Texas area and spread throughout North America and Central America. So there, there was there were Africans 
there were Africans from North Africa who who basically left in whole fleets trying to escape Roman oppression, and they landed in the ancient Americas. They very well could be the origin of the Toltecs or Zapotec. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's real history, guys. The last good, the last great king they had had was King Juba. He opposed Rome. A whole bunch of people opposed Rome. They just couldn't take them, though. Especially, like, I have a video about this, but what do you do? You know, you're King Mithridates IV, and you organized the greatest slaughter of Roman people the world has ever seen, and you did it without an army. Y'all, did y'all know that? King Mithridates of Pontus IV had his people go out, and, and, and they went all over the Roman-occupied provinces of the Mediterranean, and they timed it for a year in the future. On this date, every single city in all these provinces, all the locals were going to get up and murder every Roman centurion soldier, every Roman jeweler, every Roman slaver, every Roman tradesman, every single Roman man, woman, and child in their countries. They were on this one certain day in the future, they would do that. 85,000 Romans lost their life on that day. Rome was pissed. It's the story of, of the Poison King, Mithridates IV. I have a video about him. You might want to look at it because he was about to beat the hell out of Rome when all of a sudden Artificial Intelligence X intervened and dropped a rock from the sky and stopped the whole battle. That was all the Romans needed to get reinforcements. That was terrible. Yeah, can't, you can't tell me. You can't tell me that AIX... Hank Hill plus Dr. Phil. Goodyear blip. You know what, man? I, I'll take that as a compliment. Somebody just said I'm Hank Hill and Dr. Phil. I can't stand Dr. Phil, but I'll drink to Hank Hill. Thank you. Where? Well, let's see. <coughs> Damn old crazy. Jacob near Kurukshetra in India where the great fight happened. But no one knows reality and real history of this place. Wow. Well, I know the history, and I know that the East beat the shit out of the West. It's uh, uh, yeah, Babylon, Babylon, uh, Tootle, Tootle, Arya, it's Babylon, Assyria, retainers. I know it was a and the Book of Jasher names all the oh my God, all the that that joined Nimrod and uh, <clears throat> Amraphel. Hammurabi joined him and took off, took off over the Euphrates, past Elam, went all the way to Kork Shetra and got their asses kicked. Yeah. It was totally embarrassing for the West. Sure was. <laughs> Hank Hill and Dr. Phil. Boy, I swear. There was a large population of Amuru that went into Ethiopia. And this is the subject matter for a lot of books from the 1800s, too. It's a, a large population of Amuru went into Ethiopia and uh, took a lot of... They were basically hiding hiding from Assyrians and all that. So, yeah, there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of African blood. A lot of African blood is in... Is in the deal, but then again, you have to understand, man. Me, I mean, there's not a racial bone in my body. I don't care. I don't care what your race is. The the old Brahmic code of uh, of ancient India is no different than than the uh, it's the it's the it's the Abrahamic code. It's in Genesis. It's a whole list of prophecies that apply to all people. And remember, it goes with my belief, guys. It's it's. Oh, Orpheus. Somebody asked me what Orpheus is. What do you think about Orpheus? Orpheus was the first Christian. Orpheus was the first Christ. Orpheus was the first crucified. Yeah. Much of what you call Christianity is straight out of the Orphic faith. As a matter of fact, it was an Orphic stage play for which we got all the scenery for the Passion. Yes, sir. Yeah, man, you guys, you guys can't get tripped up on race. Just can't do it, man. There's no, there's no reason to get tripped up on, on race. You're talking, 
you're listening to the voice of a guy who absolutely teaches and believes with 100% with 100% of my being as I've revealed in my videos that I have been every race because it's absolutely necessary the oversoul would see to the maturity of the spirit within by making me live through avatars from every different perspective that means throughout history it doesn't matter what I discover about the pedigree of different nations and where I belong as an avatar presently right now with that with that group it doesn't matter because in ancient times i would have been somebody else i would have been attached to a whole different series of of genetic profiles and it's 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 all it's not about our avatars i can accept the fact that i, I have probably died on the floor of a roman co coliseum surrounded by human shit from people being scared forced to fight to death i was probably a black guy fighting a, fight, fighting a tartar or an asian guy or 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 or, or maybe a, a mauritarian i don't know or maybe a roman gladiator who was in full armor and I had some bullshit weapon and he, and he stabbed and killed me and I bled out and I laid down in human shit from other people who were dying in entrails. I can accept that. I can accept that because I believe that I have been many, many, many different personalities throughout this whole deal as I've been accruing the maturity of the immortal within. This is, this is my, this is my core belief. Nothing else makes sense to me. Nothing makes sense that for, for, because I believe in a God of equity. I believe the oversoul is giving everybody equal play, every everybody a fair chance. I believe when we pass through the kingdom of Seeker and we stand before the gates of Rostow, I believe those gates will open for me because I have been all these things and I have learned and matured. I've gone through all of that. I do not believe the oversoul will deny somebody access to the beyond unless he's given them fair play. I just don't believe that. Oversoul is way too benevolent. He's a benefactor or she's a benefactor. I don't claim to know what it is. I just claim to, to feel it because I have intuition and I have imagination and I have empathy. And those three qualities make me beyond the perimeters of this world. And because I experience those, those qualities, I know for a fact that I belong to something that's far beyond this avatar I experience. So yeah, I don't, I don't get tripped up on the racial stuff. I get frustrated that people that people attach so much significance to their current racial pedigree you know what i mean you're, I mean, you're black and you steady ask me questions trying to trigger me trying try, trying to basically race bait me over and over on my channel just trying to get me to say something that you can use and then quote me and then you know what i i blocked you guys over and over and over and over just like the white supremacists that all are always sending me emails and and making comments and trying to get me to say something that'll agree with their paradigm i'm not going to do it sometimes the black guys are right sometimes the white guys are right but why would i agree to either one when it's only right in a certain context. I'm not going to do that. I might be an old country boy, but but there's there's much more benefit to understanding the real reality than to isolating particulars of a certain reality that happened at a certain time. I'm not going to get fixated on that small shit. I'm just not. Don't care. Just don't care. Is it possible that America was once attached to another continent? Listen, I don't know about that. I haven't seen any 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 evidence of that. But I will say this: there is a lot of evidence that that the Emerald Isles, Britain, Cornwall, Spain. Listen, there was another landmass attached to that. At one time, it was much larger. There are many tra traditions, ancient Welsh traditions, of a whole area out there that just sank. Cities and people, populations, all of them gone that was in that area of the world. We have likewise, we have uh, uh, another similar uh, group of traditions from the emptiest barren ocean in the world, the Southern Pacific. There's nothing out there. But we have traditions of the Maori. We have traditions of Southeast Asia. We have fragments of beliefs from the micro, Micronesians, the Melanesians, the Polynesians. They all tell the same story. There was a supercontinent in that area, and it went under. And, the, and it makes sense because we have Maori, we have Mari all over these tens of thousands of islands through the mid and southern Pacific, and they don't make sense. Some of these islands aren't even big enough to have the little flat top pyramids that are found on them. 
We're looking at ancient hilltops. It's almost as if subsidence brought down the whole area to two or three hundred feet. But yeah, uh, there has been continents. And then there's like Davis Island. I don't know if any of you heard about Davis Island, but it's close to Easter Island. And English navigators knew about Davis Island. It was on maps. Many navigators had seen it because the ship logs and maritime law, it is illegal to not put in the ship's logs something that was seen as far as a geographical landmark. At sea, if anybody sees anything that's out there, it must be entered into the ship's log. That's maritime law. So Davis Island was always logged in, and then all of a sudden it was gone. All the people, everything, it was completely vanished. It's not the only island. It was in the 1800s. It's not the only island. There has been documented evidence of other islands. And even the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic uh, is, is believed to have at one time arisen because there's a ship's log. I, I read this in the writings of David Hatcher Childress when, when a ship saw an island that wasn't on any maps. And he went to the island, checked it out, and they found fossilized swords and armor and different stuff all over the uh, evidence of architecture and they documented exactly where its coordinates were and they went about their business because they're in a shipping lane they got to go there they got to go about their business never seen again the incident was disbelieved but the crew swore up and down that they explored the island and that there was artifacts on it yeah, so it's almost like volcanism brings the area up for a while. It drains off after a couple of weeks. Ship comes by. They check it out. They burn off two or three days later. Uh, whatever that pressure was is released in the form of gaseous bubbles, and the whole area goes back down. Yes, the reason I'm saying it this way is because we also have incidents in the historical record where ships just lost their buoyancy and there was nothing wrong with the keel or anything and they just sank. And the only way that would happen is if the air is if the water had become aerated. Yes. If there's a lot of hot air being released from a vent, that whole area can't hold weight anymore. So the whole ship would just Sailing and all of a sudden just bloop, plunge because the water can't hold the weight. So it's full of air. This has happened as well. There it goes. That's one of my tangents again. One of my tangents. All right, let me get over here. This, this is getting in my way. Wow, I got more likes than I got people listening. How'd that happen? Hey, Crystal Shaman. Just saw you. All right. Let's see here. Now, you guys are great, man. You, hey, you guys are an awesome community. There's no doubt. Abel Chavez, man, I really appreciate that. Hold on. All three Abrahamic faiths are like the engine, so to speak, for the process of reincarnation. Yep. I get it. I get it. Shroud of Turin just may be the actual shroud of Jacques de Molay when they killed him in 1314 AD, the head of the Knights Templar. Thank you, Julia Galtic. Jeez walks about. I don't know what that means, but I appreciate it. Why is the truth movement occurring? Is it because of the internet? I don't know. I don't know. I didn't even know anything about a truth movement. I'd never heard anything about it until about 2020 when I realized it was a community and not just some guys putting out videos and all. I, you know what? I just, you got to understand, I was kind of retarded when I started my, my YouTube channel. I was working full time in the oil industry, oil and gas, and I didn't have any time, but twice a week I'd upload a video. Twice a week I'd just upload videos to get all my data. I wanted to preserve all my data. At that time, I had no fear whatsoever that, that YouTube might take it all down one time. I didn't understand none of that stuff. I was just learning. And uh, I, I mean, for the longest time, I had 300 subs. I had 300 subs for over like a year. And then all of a sudden, it started growing. 400, 500, 600. But still, I think there's people that remember, I still had, I had like, I had like 2,500 subs after two years and it didn't grow. It just, it was just, it was stagnant. And then I started growing and, and, uh, I, I did a podcast with EOTT, Jimmy James. He's no longer with us today, but I did one with Jimmy James and I grew a little bit after that. And some point around 4,200 subs, 
Santos Bonacci reached down and, and interviewed me once and then interviewed me again. Uh, haven't heard from Santos in a while, but uh, Santos reached down and I, and I blew up. And, and, I, and I, even, I even mentioned it in like three videos that I owe my present success on YouTube to Santos Bonacci. He did that. But, uh, yeah, him and uh, Logan, I'm supposed to be doing another another video with Logan pretty soon. I can't remember when. Uh, I got to get uh, esoteric, esoteric Nights of Malta. He and I were scheduled for Monday, but I had some personal things come up. And then I had already scheduled two days in advance to do this live, so it kind of bumped him out the way. But Esoteric Nights of Malta and I, we're supposed to be doing, we're focusing on the United Kingdom, Cornwall, Wales, you know, the Welsh, Isle of Man, uh, about about ancient history in Britain and, and the Giants. Uh, I got to get I got to get with him because uh, it's just things were just chaotic in my life. I, I'm just really busy doing things. And just kind of, I don't know who Billy Meyer is. I heard the name. I don't know the 45 pieces of the Bible that are taken out, but I've read the entire pseudo I also read all the Apocrypha. So I don't, I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of books that are pseudo-biblical. And I've, the forgotten lost books of the Bible and the forgotten books of Eden, I've read them all. There's like 60 books there. I have two Ralph Ellis books on, on my uh, shelf back here that somebody had asked me to read. I have not read at Ralph Ellis yet. No, I haven't. And I'm going, yes, somebody, Crazy Mom 123 sent me a fantastic, yeah, I'm answering the deal. Did you show your cool statue that somebody sent you yet? I haven't showed it yet. No. Yeah. Crazy Mom 123, I am, I'm going to show it. They sent me a letter of marquee proving its, proving its value and its, how old it is and where it came from when it was shipped overseas. I was really humbled. I just, I had it in my lap for a long time, just looking at it like, Oh my God, how did people in the Orient even do this without fracturing the stone? It's a Phoenix, but it's got so many angles and feathers. It's all made out of semi-precious stones. It's amazing. It's amazing. Almost went out and bought a safe. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler Arnold. Jason is the only channel whose videos are worth multiple watches. Hey, I appreciate that. There are other channels that are good. Hell, I watch other people, but I do appreciate the sentiment. The reason the reason people watch my videos multiple times is because I really don't give them a break. I, I really deluge them with data. So it's hard to process when people go back and listen to videos multiple times. And I get it. I get it. I, I'm, I'm, I've always gone full tilt, and I really should do shorter videos that that stick with one topic but you know what i just can't slow down man i just can't i, I get i get discouraged when i can't just flow I get discouraged yeah the mad the conversion rate is terrible yeah you're right dials mavis yeah, people. Yeah, people don't think that's five hundred bucks. Although, if you wanted to donate five hundred bucks, you're not going to get no argument from me. Just make sure you're able to do that. Don't don't put yourself out for me. You won't never hear me trying to pedal you. Pedal you. Okay, <clears throat> Matt M. Angkor Wat to Cambodian temples. Well, first of all, I do not believe the official narrative about Angkor, Angkor Wat only being from like the 5th, 6th, 7th century AD. I'm not, I'm not trying to hear that. Angkor Wat is far older. In addition, there have been archaeologists who have been shunned away from the place when they saw on site absolute evidence that the buildings go far deeper underground than anticipated and that it was built on an older substructure, meaning there's a prior Angkor Wat, Wat underneath that the present on Angkor Wat was built on top of, that changes everything. So I need to do a little bit more. I need to dig out more of my notes. I have a lot of notes on Angkor Wat, but I didn't have them prepared. I have so much data that I can't just freestyle something. I have to go back and look at my notes before I, I talk about Angkor Wat. It was, it, it is the subject matter because it's not just Angkor Wat. Cambodia itself has many other sites that are very old. One of them is technolithic. That came to my attention through a uh, Maybe James O'Conn, 
Brian Forrester, somebody wrote a book that mentioned something in, in Angkor, I mean, in Cambodia, that was not heliolithic. It was definitely technolithic. So, yeah, that's, that's something we'll, we'll, we'll explore. Thank you, Aaron Paradox. Ha, you love International Harvester? Yep. This is a donation. That, that's a donation. Somebody donated that. 1902, International Harvester. Oh, I got a really beautiful Phoenix shirt somebody somebody had made and sent it to me. I'll wear that one. I got a really I got a white shirt that has 1902 on it to archaics or something like that. It, it was made by somebody who, who makes t-shirts and sent it to me. I really and I hey, like I said, I appreciate that. 45 pieces of the Bible. 45 pieces of all right. Okay. Peter Massey, have you come across any information on Sasquatch in your long? All right, listen. I've already said this in another video, just like in the last week. So I'll say it real quick. Again, the book of Jasher that, that J Dreamers was citing earlier, the book of Jasher has the oldest historical reference to a Sasquatch that I have ever found. It's in the story of Zepho. Zepho was a hero descended. He was the son or grandson of Esau. And he went to, to the kingdom of Latinum, which was in Italia. This is, this is before Rome was there. And the people were terrified that this, that this shaggy man-like monster was living in a cave and eating their sheep and goats. Zepho, wanting to gain the hearts of the people, staked him out, watched him for a while, waited for him to go feed, attacked him, and killed him. So it is the first reference I've ever seen to a Yeti or, or a Bigfoot type Sasquatch. But it's in the Book of Jasher, which is a very old text. And that's, 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 that's about as far back as I can go. I'm not saying it's the oldest, but it's the oldest I've ever come across. All right, let's see. Two hours and five minutes. Yes, we are lost at sea. In fourteen in fourteen forty seven BC, the uh, the volcano, the volcano, what the hell's that volcano? Thera, the volcano Thera exploded and basically ended the Minoan civilization. This is why the Mycenaean civilization filled the power vacuum. When they filled, when they filled the power vacuum, they acquired the help of the Amuru Danan fleets. That's the only way they were able to then uh, defeat the, uh, the kingdom of Ilium, which you know of as the fall of Troy. But yeah, that was the Minoan civilization. It lasted a long time, very peaceful civilization. Yeah, talk, talking about hyperbolic curves on 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 water ducts and all that plumbing. Yeah, it was very sophisticated. They were wiped out when that volcano erupted, destroyed the Minoan civilization. Let's see. I got to the bottom of the thread. No, my thread uh, froze. It froze a little bit. Have you read about the Roman emperor who was a giant? Yes, I have. It was in the AD period. I did. I did. I have no, he's in Chronicon. I cite his height and what different ancient writers talked about him. But yeah, he was, he was huge. He was humongous. He was humongous. There was one Roman emperor who was descended from the giants. There's no doubt. I can't remember. I don't have the details with me, but he's in Chronicon. Yeah, the Titans came back. That the size of the Avatar doesn't change the spirit within. Yeah, when, when when people were under the vapor canopy, they were Titanic in size. When they died and came back as their offspring, they came into giants. When those giants were 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 gone and all that, they were normal humans. Yeah. No doubt. 
Yeah, being tight, being a titan didn't change him from being human. It was it, it was the it was because of their size, due to the the type of biosphere that promoted that type of growth under the vapor canopy. Yes, the Phoenix event can re result in petrified flesh. I've already explained in other videos that the Phoenix, the Phoenix phenomenon is the reason why we have petrified jellyfish and fossilized earthworms and all kinds of things that don't have hard shell bodies and yet they're found perfectly preserved in the fossil record. Things that doesn't make sense. They're flash frozen. They were flash frozen and then before they could thaw out, they were mineralized, totally petrified into rock. Yeah, well, when you say giants too, I would, I am not, I'm not on board with giants being what's being described in a lot of fairy tales and all that. I'm not on board with that, man. I know this, I'm six foot tall. And if I come into contact with an eight, if a guy is eight foot and a half and he's in full battle regalia and armor, I'm going to look up at him. He's going to be gigantic to me. There's no doubt. The Romans described themselves as fighting giants in Teutonburg when they fought the Norse, when they fought the Goths. You know, they're fighting. Here, here's some guys that are here's some guys that are on average five foot two and five foot three at their tallest. The Ro the Roman soldiers. Here they are going up against these people north of the Rhine, who were six foot four, six foot six on the front line. In full armor, oh, they feel like they're fighting giants. So, yeah, it's and, and of course, I mean, we do have all the measurements. Most of the giants back then were nine foot, nine foot, nine foot, ten inches tall, stuff like that. Now the titans would have been twelve foot, thirteen foot. So let let some of the let some of the Smithsonian reports from the 1870s, 1860s, 1850s, all the way up to the 1910s be true. Then we found those skeletons of people that were twelve and thirteen foot. There's no doubt. Joel Amos, Jason, Rikion was the first pharaoh of Egypt that Abraham met in the book of Jasher. Okay, that's cool. Well, if that's the case, then there's a story that goes with that. Because there's an Egyptian record, Westcar Papyrus or the Turin Papyrus. One of them describes a man of Phaistos who was 110 years of age who visited Pharaoh in Egypt and told him that he knew the secrets of Thoth and that an object that had been found in the desert and the Pharaoh wanted, wanted this stranger of 110 years old who was a shepherd to go interpret what was, what was found, what was called the plans with numbers. In my book, in my book, The Lost Scriptures of Giza, I, I, I cite this record and what it says. And I show that in the book of Genesis, we find that Abram, when he was 110 years old, visited Pharaoh's court. But in Genesis, it doesn't say anything about him knowing the plans with numbers or knowing the secrets of Thoth. It just it just goes, it says he visited Pharaoh's court. Now, the book of Jasher does say that Abraham went into uh, uh, Egypt and taught Pharaoh's house. So we have a lot of correlate. We have some pretty interesting correlates here. It's in my book. Uh, it's in my book. The law. This ancient Egyptian writing about this old man of 110 years old going in to teach Pharaoh about the the, the mysteries of Thoth is the, uh, those sources are cited in my in my Law Scriptures book. Yeah, it's no coincidence. It's no coincidence at all. I have a copy of the Orland book and uh, Annam Leach. Uh, please, please look up Aura Lind book, Aura Lind in uh, the search bar on my on my uh, YouTube channel because I have a whole video about the Aura Lind. Jonathan Harrison, homeboy, <laughs> I see you, man. Three thirty-two p.m. You made that comment, and it's already three. Okay, you just now made that comment. Yeah, man. Oh, man, it's Tuesday too. I got it. sure is. Wow. Almost you almost caught me slipping, brother. I will see you this afternoon. I will see you this afternoon. 
Yeah, guys. It's uh, 2 hours and 33 minutes. I feel my momentum has completely died here. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. You want more information about the Amuru, about the Israelites, the Old Testament, and how they spread all over the, the anciently known world. I appreciate the donations, guys. I really appreciate this chat. You guys, you guys have, uh, there's a lot of interaction here. I see a lot of people providing information too. This is great. Also, those three links in the description box, please check them out. That is now the new official Archaics Errant chat all over the world. Everybody can join that chat. Uh, find out in your own communities who's there. You know, you might, you might be living to somebody, you might be living very, very close to somebody else who's all also watching the Archaics material. So, yeah. It's been a good one. I'm hot as hell, sweating my ass off. And I'm going to go ahead and call, call this video a close. Thank you to my moderators. Esoteric Knights of Malta, I see you right there at 3.30. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, I'll get with you later, man. I'm sorry, man, that, that we haven't been able to connect. All kinds of things coming up lately. But I, you will get my email today, man. And for the rest of you, I'm signing out.